Hello, gorgeous people, and welcome to another TV Central one-on-one podcast. I'm Aaron Ryan. This is episode 62, 2023. Every Family Has a Secret is back for a gripping new season and is SBS's flagship documentary series that follows everyday Australians as they discover the astonishing truth about their family's past and confront the extraordinary secrets that have shaped their lives. Season four kicks off with an explosive premiere, which will mark the first time in Every Family Has a Secret history that the series will deviate from its usual format, featuring one rather than two intertwining stories due to the truly epic nature of what is revealed. The new season kicks off Thursday, 19 October 2023 at 7.30pm on SBS and SBS On Demand. Presenter of the series is none other than Logie, AFI and actor award winning performer and Australian legend Noni Hazelhurst. She has graced our screen since 1974 and is a firm favourite in all of our hearts with memorable performances in The Sullivans, Play School, Better Homes and Gardens and A Place to Call Home plus heaps of others. To discuss the new season of Every Family Has a Secret, it's a welcome return podcast for Noni Hazelhurst. Noni, thank you for joining me. G'day, Aaron. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Um, Our last podcast was uh, primarily about your heartwarming and liberating series, The End. Mm. We certainly got to see a new side of you, literally. (laughs) We (laughs) we chatted before the series went out. What was the reaction and feedback you received from Foxtel and, and, and the general audience? Uh, look, the general reaction that I got was that it was a nice change and it was very liberating for me, I have to say, after playing Elizabeth Bly in A Place to Call Home for six years. It was nice to give other parts of my personality a bit of an airing after um, concentrating so hard on that kind of repressed, secretive, uppity, elitist, you know, big fish in a small pond character that Elizabeth Bly was. To play um, that character was a joy because she just, you know, didn't give a flying F about anything. And (laughs) she was, uh, you know, she liked her recreational drugs and she, you know, liked swimming naked in the retirement village pool. And, you know, she's a very much a free spirit. So it was, uh, I think people appreciated seeing that other side of me as much as I enjoyed playing it. There are many uh, obvious cultures and minorities that can be overlooked in terms of representation on the screen, but elderly people are often forgotten because they are represented, but often it's how they're represented um, that's the key. Obviously, not uh, represented as people that enjoy love, sex and emotions, but rather sort of nice grannies handing out chocolates to the grandkids. Are, are you really proud that you were able to break down some walls and, and show older Australians with more substance? Yeah. Um, you know, I turned 70 a couple of months ago and, you know, to ah. hear, here I am being the host of this wonderful program. I mean, I feel very privileged to still have longevity and, and you know, I'm still in demand. But the sad thing is that most of the roles I get offered now dramatically are either people with Alzheimer's or dementia <laughs> or they're on their deathbed or they're a silly old duffer. Um, and so, you know, to, to have scripts like The End and, um, oh, various things that I have actually chosen to do are upright with Tim Minchin, you know, and a lot of these things, and also uh, just recently One Night um, with uh, Yael Stone and Jodie Whittaker and Nicole De Silva, which was written by a woman, directed by women. I mean, a lot of these stories that honour older people, particularly older women, are coming from women. And I think that's very telling because older women are the ones, you know, normally that get more overlooked and uh, whether it's in society or in the media. And so it is, It is. I think, beholden on all of us who have a voice um, in the older age groups to say, hello, um, we're still here and we might actually have something that you might benefit from knowing, um, whether it's not to make the same mistakes we made. Um, but, you know, it's, it is, I think it's changing ever so slightly, but I do think it's the work of people like, for example, Gina Davis in Hollywood, who's, you know, around about my age, and she's been doing so so many amazing things for to progress women um, in not only in the industry, but you know, look at how women's rights are being repealed all over America and in various mm. other countries. You know, LGBTQI rights are being um, put at risk again. So you know, all of us who are so called minorities, uh, even though women are more than half the population we have to stand up and say, you know, we're all equal. We all deserve respect. We're all part of humanity and we all have white skeletons. So can we just stop with the bullshit that, you know, one lot of people are more important than another lot because it ain't true. 
Amen. Mm. Well, let's get to uh, every family has a secret. D- yeah. Does it blow your mind the amount of stories that you come across and the and the intensity of emotions that each story brings? It doesn't blow my mind the number because I do believe that scratch the surface, most people have a story to tell and often it involves secrets. Um, the effect that it has on people it is remarkable. I mean, I can't think of a single instance where you couldn't viscerally notice a change in our subjects after they'd completed their journeys um, with us. I mean, not to say the journeys are complete. I'm sure they still go on. But it is um, it is mind-boggling to think that people have gone to their graves with some of these secrets, you know, that they haven't shared these deeper, darker things that have happened in their lives with their children, for example. You know, that children grow up not knowing who their parents are. Uh, they get the parent version of the person, but uh, mm. often either we don't ask or we're too scared to ask or people put up screens or whatever it is. But, you know, I, I was sort of inspired to be part of this show because my mother had a lot of secrets that she would not speak about in her past. And I felt like I'd been relegated to the, purely the role of daughter, that I could never be her her friend because she didn't confide in me any of the stuff that, you know, made her the way she was. And I wish I'd known. So I understand the burning need that people have, but we've got so many people now that the program is known applying uh, to to be a subject because, A, it's done very, very well and very carefully and responsibly, but it really helps them to um, get to the bottom of something that in some cases has haunted them their whole lives. I mean, we've got one instance of a, one of our subjects in the first series, Marie Ann Keith. It took us three years, but we found her father. We wow. did, didn't find him in the first season, but we kept trying and trying and trying. We have ongoing relationships with all of our subjects because, you know, we look after them and they become like family because they trust us and they're very vulnerable with us. Um, wow. but look, the whole thing is mind boggling because I think in a nutshell, it's mind boggling to have such engaging, intelligent uh, entertainment on television. Although the title of the show is about secrets, it seems to me from watching uh, some of the episodes that the participants in the show are looking for more uh, than an answer to a secret. Their investigation seems to bring issues such as identity, connection, resolution, um, and what is revealed is is linked to who they are. So in that sense, the show would be would mean so much to the to the people involved. Do you see it more than just people looking for answers? Yeah, I, I very much appreciate in the program the historical breakouts where you get the context in which their families or their family members were operating. And so, you know, if you just laid out the facts and said, oh, your father was a Nazi sympathiser who, you know, was responsible for putting so many people to their deaths, or that doesn't help. You know, you have to be able to say, you have to be able to do the research into what were the prevailing circumstances in which these people were living, often when they were very young, and how easily they might have been influenced, you know. So in many cases, there's a cautionary tale to be told about the consequences of choices that we make as individuals. And so in that sense, the storytelling aspect of it, I think, is incredibly important. Um, and it, it particularly helps our subjects when we we show them what was brought to bear upon their decision making in the past and and that it wouldn't make sense or it wouldn't comfort them if they were just told, you know, the, the bare facts. It has to have a context. And I think that's one of the things the program does really well. And it's educational as well. I mean, there's so many things I find out that I didn't know about, you know, people's loyalties or sympathisers or, you know, various other aspects that get brought up, which are really interesting. Well, let's talk about the big first episode. Jackie Blackford and Michael yeah. Devjanovic travel to France, uh, Italy and the UK on a mission to find answers about their French-born mother um, and her coming to Australia after World War II. Mm. This was a big episode. You were over in my heartland of WA for this one. Um, can you tell me more about this episode? Yeah, I don't want to give the plot away too much, but it's a half-brother and sister who wanted to make sense of why their mother was the way she was. Their mother to their knowledge and in their experience, was a very, very timid, shy woman who did not like socialising, who would not speak about her past in any way, shape or form. And the things we uncovered were were quite remarkable. From the age of about 15 or 16, their mother ran away from home. Her father was a French pharmacist 
in Paris, I believe, um, she ran away from home and became a Nazi advocate. And as a young, young girl, older teenager, but still very young girl, she was running around Europe trying to advocate for the Nazis, proselytising for the Nazis. She married at least twice, um, several identities, you know, just a completely different person to the one they knew. Absolutely 100% couldn't have been more different. And the thing that we uncovered during the course of our research, and, you know, you'd have to think there's divine intervention involved here, we discovered Mm -hmm. that within about three weeks, I think, of us discovering this, they were set to lose an inheritance from their mother's family that would have reverted back to the French government had they not claimed it. So we had to get them over there real quick to get mm-hmm. get hold of the inheritance. So, you know, even though they found out things about their mother, and, and what's really interesting is because Jackie's a, a bit younger than Mike, she had a different relationship with her mother. Mike knew his, her, his mother back in Europe when they migrated to Australia, whereas Jackie was born in Australia. So they had very different experiences of, of uh, life with their mum. And Mike took the whole thing a lot harder than Jackie, uh, who was a bit more, not impressed, but she was a bit more wide-eyed amazed, whereas Mike, I think, was more shocked um, mm. and pained by, by the resolution of what we discovered. So that dynamic is interesting in itself, how people kind of, ameliorate the effects of what we've discovered and they had each other at least and you know they've since seen the program and and very Mike's very happy with it they're both very happy with it the way it's been done but yeah the the you know the 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 sheer dichotomy between what they knew and who she had been was absolutely amazing absolutely amazing you you couldn't write it you know it's just beyond anything I've experienced before I mean most of the stories are yeah, I, I think I like the episodes where participants get more than what they're expecting. Um, mm. That couple, uh, the half-brother and sister, were obviously looking for specific answers, which they got. But, um, yeah, that whole little inheritance surprise, <laughs> they were not expecting that at all, were they? You could tell No, neither were we. Neither were we. <laughs> and this, this does sometimes happen when you're actually out on the road following up what they've already discovered. Something else will turn up in Season 1 we discovered not only a a woman who'd grown up not knowing her birth date, uh, had no idea what her name was, Um, and she'd been told the only sibling she had was dead. We we discovered not only a half-brother living in America, but the sibling that she thought was dead. Mm. Um, And and we discovered that her family would have issued a death certificate because that was a way in this particular eastern country that they would have got some relief from the government by declaring him dead. So, I mean, this we gave this person an identity for the first time in her life. She knew who the heck she was and where she came from and met family members. And you could see this visceral, palpable change in her from being very, very tight and very, you know, precise. She'd been an acrobat as a child all through her life and exploited Um she became this beaming, expansive, effusive woman, and she took her daughter with her to to the, her home country, with whom she'd always had a close but not particularly physical relationship. And you again, you could see this relationship develop and grow and change between mother and daughter as they met their family. And Olivia saw her mum blossom, you know, in, in a way she'd never seen seen before. And you could see it on the screen. It was just magical. I feel a little bit emotional about the next question. And you know what? I haven't actually seen this episode. It's just a synopsis. Like I've seen episode one and two, but I believe there's an episode further down the line where a proud uh, Kuri woman, Paula, um, raises, an or- raises an orphan, discovers her father's actually alive. I mean, just the thought of coming on a show like this, knowing that you've already got some answers, which is that you're an orphan and, you know, you're looking for other answers, but then to discover that your father is actually alive. I mean, how does one process something like that? Well, not only he's alive, but he has, you know, there is some history uh, that is, you know, not very palatable around him in his life. Um, And, you know, to have been brought up as an Indigenous woman in Australia anyway, and, you know, could this be more topical? um, She's already experienced, you know, a lifelong and palpable sense of loss just because she's an Indigenous person in Australia. So for her to, and we know also how much Indigenous, our Indigenous 
brothers and sisters value family relationships and family ties. Mm. Um, it, again, it's it's very moving. You know, it, it it puts her through the ringer. It absolutely does. But it also exposes her to relatives that she didn't know she had who were able to provide some context for her. And so, you know, ultimately, again, it, it's very fulfilling, but it's very confronting. And, and your heart goes out to her because she has not had an easy life by any stretch. Uh, and so, again, it, it's just wonderful to be able to not bring closure because these things are never closed, but to bring her some peace and some relief uh, that, you know, things that she'd worried about weren't necessarily true in her past. But then there's other things that maybe she would have preferred not to know. But I think all our subjects in the end uh, are relieved that they've gone on the journey because we make sure that they're supported afterwards. We don't just go, there you go, bye-bye. Mm. Um, there's a real sense of responsibility towards our, our subjects, which, which I think is, you know, the least we can do. I guess the series, uh, there's a hope that it's supposed to give us a sense of resolve uh, for people. However, have you experienced within any of the stories um, that have unfolded where answers actually bring more questions or because of the circumstances, there's just some questions that can't be answered? Yeah, we don't resolve, we, we aren't able to resolve everything. Um, there's one episode in this series that features one of Australia's prominent historians, Dr. Grace Carsten, who discovers um, an uncle that she really didn't know she had. Um, he's not around. He, he disappeared. And so she she's, we take her to Europe to follow in his footsteps. And, again, these were very young boys at the time, her father and his brother, and they were on different sides of the Nazi fence. Um, and although she doesn't, we can't ultimately find him or what happened to him, it's one of the most poignant stories that we've ever done because we discover by the end, I'm trying not to give it away, but we discover by the end that he really didn't want to be in the position he was in, but mm. that he was doing it, he thought, for his family. And there's this beautiful moment at the end where on the back of the photo that she finds after her father's death of this brother, it says, think of me sometimes. And I, I get churned up thinking about it. The mm. poignancy of this young boy, you know, who's lost forever to his family and friends, uh, in the war and was never spoken of again, you know. And so for Grace to be able to revive his memory and knowledge of this man's existence is very powerful for her. Quite uh, often in the series you have the cup of tea with the participant and simply listen while mm -hmm. they tell their story. Do you enjoy that aspect of the show, just hearing the rather impactful stories of everyday Australians? Well, that's my that's my role. My role, because people sort of know me or a version of me through what I've done in the past, there tends to be a, a level of trust that, um, and, you know, these people are not media savvy. They've, they've not been on television before, most 99.9% of them. Um, and so it takes a lot of courage to, to step up and go, okay, I'll let myself be interviewed with a film crew and I'll put my trust in their hands and go wherever they take me. And sometimes there's family opposition to them going on this journey as well, you know, not necessarily um, everyone in the family approves of what they're doing. So my job is I get briefed on what the story's about, obviously. I generally know mostly what they're going to discover, but my job is to make them relax and just tell me the story, enough to seed it for the audience. And we might chat for 45 minutes, which gets cut down to three minutes. So <laughs> it's my job really to, because they don't know the crew at all. There's only like four, four or five people in the crew, but they know me, most of them. So I get them just to talk to me. And it's it's a lot easier for them because, you know, they feel at home with me. And so yeah. my job is to tease the story out. And I know the key points that we have to hit. Um, but just to make them feel relaxed. And occasionally I'll get a follow-up, you know, when they've come back, but that doesn't always happen. But I, I just love, I'm a storyteller, you know, and any artist of any description is a storyteller, any community. Yeah. And, and so the more stories we can tell, the more stories we can, more human stories we can tell, I think the greater the benefit, particularly in these divisive times where we're making you know, judgments about who people are based on their attitude to this or that or the other thing. And yet, as I said at the beginning, scratch anybody and under the surface there's a really interesting story. So that's my job is to, A, relax them and, B, 
for the for the program makers to to draw out the story in a way that um, you know, to, if the audience is at home going, what do they mean by that? Then my job is to say, what do you mean by that? So I'm, I'm guiding the, not only the subject, but also the audience towards the journey we're about to go on. Well, it's going to be a, a great season. Um, before you go, just a, a couple of other questions, though. Um, as, as being on our screens for so long, I just sort of wanted to give you the opportunity to give your view on the state of Australian drama. Because on one hand, we're we're not getting the long form dramas on our screens, you know, like in the likes of like a country practice or Pack to the Rafters on free to wear. Um, that seems to have disappeared. But we're getting much riskier forms of content through the streamers, you know, like obviously the end um, um, through the public broadcasters, like the wonderful uh, Marta Dusseldorp in Bay of Fires. Um, and then sharper, shorter dramas on free to air. Do you think we're in a better place, or are we going backwards in terms of because the free to airs aren't commissioning those long form dramas anymore? No, well, the free to airs, you know, they're fighting for commercial dollar and losing. Um, and it's chicken and the egg. You know, did did they start losing viewers because they were putting crap to air, or you know, was it going to happen anyway? Um, I think they're loath to spend money, which is why we have a, a preponderance of so-called reality shows, because they're cheap and they can exploit the audience and they can exploit uh, the subjects and create drama, um, you know, instead of actually writing drama and putting it together as a drama, they're, they're creating fake drama, um, which really worries me because, you know, Aaron, you've got a whole generation of kids growing up now thinking that's how real housewives behave because it says <laughs> these are real housewives. Um, and unless you've got an adult in the room who contextualises it for you and points out how you're being or they're being manipulated or, you know, whatever it might be, how are kids able to discern what's what's real and what isn't? Um, I also think that the, the lowering and, and indeed cancelling of quotas, particularly in children's television, has had a really detrimental effect on our drama makers. Um, I think in terms of films, we're, we're doing really well. We're still punching above our weight internationally with movies. Uh, and and a lot of our television does very well too. But, yes, you're right, we don't have that long-form drama. I mean, I, I don't understand. We've got so much wonderful product that has been made over the last 40 years. I, I don't understand why we don't, why the free-to-airs don't run retrospectives of things, why they don't repeat some of these amazing series and miniseries and films that were so well done and have only had one run. I mean, it just makes no sense to me or, you know, midday movie or something, but it makes no sense that even if they're not going to spend the money, why not at least, you know, gather this Australian spirit that went into making all these amazing things that came out of the 80s and 90s and early 2000s and show them again um, and, and show people what we're capable of in the comfort of their own lounge room. But, I, you know, I do appreciate that people are choosing their own, own content now and I don't blame them. Mm. It would be good to have a lunchtime movie, a monkey grip, bring it back. <laughs> yeah, I think Sunday night at the movies, you know, why not have all the AFI and actor winning winning films from the last 20 years in a, in a you know, like Bill Collins used to do. I'm available. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, is there anything, well, that might be uh, the answer, but is there anything left on the on the bucket list in terms of acting? Um, you haven't been in Neighbours yet, but is, is there anything left on the bucket list? Look, I just want to keep doing telling stories. I don't care what the medium is, whether it's drama or film, television, theatre, um, radio, uh, writing, producing, directing. I don't care what it is. I just want to find good stories. And, um, you know, my criterion has always been if I wouldn't spend time watching this or paying money for this, why would I expect anyone else to? And, and is this a story that has a reason to exist? You know, is it a story worth telling? Will it have some value out in the world so you know that that remarkably narrows the field considerably but it also opens up doors to some incredible uh incredible roles which i'm i'm very grateful for and and um every family has a secret is absolutely up there with one of the things i'm most proud of with, with all the reboots going on uh, these days would you like to see any of your shows come back the end city homicide a place to call home so many to choose from well, I'm almost too old to play myself now. Um, I think <laughs> I'd, I'm, I'm sorry that the end didn't get a second go. Uh, I think that was a really powerful subject matter um, about, you know, assisted dying. Um, it was also very black and beautifully written by Samantha Strauss, who's so clever. Uh, yeah, it would have been nice to do a second series of that, but um, 
I think what what got up instead, Lambs of God or one of those, but yeah, Foxtel under the late wonderful man Brian Walsh, um, who was responsible for reviving Place to Call Home, uh, was put together some incredible dramas, and I I just hope his legacy continues because he really was. If it hadn't been for him, I think the last ten or fifteen years would have been even more dire. COVID aside, for for our segment section of the industry. Um, he was responsible for, you know, uh, commissioning a lot of wonderful world-class drama for which I am will always be grateful. Definitely. Um, and just finally, and you may have just answered it in your last question, but when you look over your career, um, I'm sure there'll be many highlights, fun memories, but mm-hmm. I wanted to ask what stands out for you as the thing you're the most proud of, which, as you said, it, m- it might be um, every family has a secret. That is one, but I think the overarching one is play school because it taught me more about communicating than anything I've ever done. Um, because if you can if you can learn a 32-page script with no auto cue that's rehearsed five times before it's ever taped uh, and do it as a continuous as live half hour, even though it's not live, it was recorded as live, which is not anymore, and hold the attention of a three- or four-year-old mm. by, by being present and speaking to the camera as though it's one person, one child, and getting an interactive response, which we do, then adults are a breeze. And so it taught me above anything else to not be afraid. I mean, one of the things I learned on play school that was profoundly affecting for me, if we made a mistake or something went terribly wrong, they wanted us to keep going. They would not stop tape unless you swore because you just saw no other way around it. And so they wanted us to model that practice makes progress and that you could problem solve. And I had been literally brought up to believe that practice makes perfect. And so what it taught me was that there is no such thing as perfect. And so it's okay to make mistakes. And that was absolutely revolutionary for me because at the beginning I thought I had to be Miss Prissy and Miss Perfect and you know, my voice was probably an octave higher the first few um, play schools that I did, trying to be, you know, very, very good. But I watched myself back with John Hamblin, funny John Hamblin, the blonde Englishman who died last year, and uh, I couldn't take my eyes off him. And and in the studio, I thought he was a bit slack and a bit, you know, he's just as likely to ad lib as, as not. And I, But he was so alive in the moment. He was so present. And I just thought, okay, I get it. I just have to be alive to what's happening at this moment on the take and do what's required, but there's a little room for elasticity and a little room for for fun as well. And so from that point on, I've never been nervous about presenting because I realised that it's okay to make mistakes and that was absolutely mind-boggling to me, absolutely mind-boggling. Well, it definitely is a legacy. I mean, I didn't have a, a fantastic childhood, but when I think back of some great memories, the, the thing that comes back actually is Benita, John and Noni um, mm. on, on on play school. Uh, that was certainly a certainly a really happy time in, in a not so great childhood. So, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a yeah, beautiful I thing. Know. Well, you know, I think what what became clear to me and, um, you know, as a result of my doing play school for 24 years, after, after only a couple of years, I decided I want to be an advocate for small children, for protecting small children. And what I realised is that we we provided unconditional love and non-judgmental acceptance to the child watching. And we created a world that was recognisable, that made sense, that moved at the pace that the child could at their age. But for many children, that unconditional love and non-judgmental acceptance, we were the only adults that, that exposed those things to some children watching. You know, we were the nicest adults that some children ever got to to meet, even through a vicarious medium like television. And so the responsibility of that was enormous. And it made me understand. I mean, back in the 80s, I was making speeches about how kids can't make sense of the world. That was before the internet. That was before computers. Mm. And I was hanging on about how confusing the world is and how how too much stimulation was leaving small children behind. And, you know, now, 20 years later, 30 years later, you've got these terrifying rates of of depression and anxiety and, you know, all these things that are impacting on our children because of this really recent, in evolutionary terms, impact of technology. 
and and capitalism and all the things that we're subject to and struggling with now, um, trying to make sense of our lives in the face of all this, you know, technology. Um, for for young children, it's even more confusing. And so, yeah, protection of young children, I think, is is one of the paramount things in my life. That if I can make any sort of impact, it's it's really about reminding people how small children need to be protected and cared for. Yes, absolutely. Well, Noni, uh, thank you for dropping by again. Certainly in the in the 150 plus podcasts I've done and then countless written type interviews, I'm always excited to talk to you. Your contribution to the Australian arts, to children's television um, and your down to earth character has been highly regarded and valued and you're an absolute blessing. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, so thanks. much appreciated. My absolute pleasure. Lovely to talk to you. Thanks for those nice words. Appreciate it. All right, that was Noni Hazelhurst, presenter of Every Family Has a Secret, which can be seen 19th of October 2023 at 7.30pm on SBS and SBS On Demand. Well, that's it for this very special podcast. For all the latest news, streaming reports, ratings, television guides and podcasts, head to tvcentral.com.au. Until next time, I'm Aaron Ryan. Thank you to the wonderful and beautiful Noni Hazelhurst. Bye for now. (laughs) 